In the past, we used to stop along the road to help those who were in need when they had car trouble. Now we just pass them by, and maybe it's because we think, yeah, they've got a cell phone. I'm sure help is on the way. And if I stop, I might frighten the poor person. I mean, think about all the horrible news stories of those who have, you know, been taken advantage of while stranded beside the road. And so, what do we do? We ultimately end up rationalizing away an opportunity to respond positively toward another human being in need. In fact, we could say that uh, in one sense, we begin to dehumanize ourselves by not taking time to be human with another human being. Here's a new way of thinking about leadership. It's simply being human, caring enough for others that we impact and influence them in positive and helpful ways. We take time for others. The parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10, 30 to 37, provides context for being human, for gaining a glimpse of Jesus' perspective on leadership. The parable is preceded by a question from an expert in the Jewish law. He wants to know what he should do to inherit eternal life. Now, Jesus points him back to the law. What does it tell you? How do you read it? And the lawyer is ready. He simply quotes what the law states in Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself, which in essence we might say is simply love God, love people. Or love God with everything you've got and give others some of that attention you've been always giving yourself. Well, Jesus affirms the Jewish expert in his orthodoxy. He says, you are correct. But then he proceeds to emphasize the need for good orthopraxy as well doing something, practicing. Do this and you will live, he says in verse 28. You know, as leaders, it's not good enough to know all the right theories about how to influence others. We also have to be doing it. In fact, the best way to learn leadership is by doing leadership. But the lawyer is not satisfied with this answer. The text tells us that he wants self-justification, so he asks another question. Okay, Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Now, this really is an interesting question, or rather, it's fascinating that one might even ask that question. And I mean, as leaders, shouldn't we be positively influencing everyone we meet? Well, here's what Jesus does. He takes the expert's passive question, who is my neighbor, and gives them an active response by telling him a story. Four men are heading down to Jerusalem to Jericho, a 17-mile trek through treacherous areas frequented by thieves. Now, the first guy is attacked by robbers, stripped of his clothing, beaten up pretty bad, and left lying in the road half dead. Now, a priest comes along, one of the uh, religious leaders of the Jews. And when he sees this guy lying half dead on the side of the road, he goes over to the other side and completely avoids him. Now, perhaps he thought that the robbers would jump on him too, and he better get out of there quickly, or Maybe he thought, you know, it'd make him ritually unclean. He was a priest after all. Well, the text notes that he was going down from Jerusalem, thus signifying that his priestly work at the temple was probably over for the week. But in any case, this leader had no mercy, no time, and probably some other important leadership duties to attend to. Well, after the priest comes a Levite, another religious leader among the Jews, and he does the same thing. He passes the uh, wounded man on the other side of the road. And somebody once noted that based on the geography of this area, the long straight road may have allowed him to see the priest way out ahead of him move around the wounded man. And so he was just following the example. He said, well, the priest knows he was dead. And so I guess I'll just go on by too. I can't be bothered either. And besides, those robbers are close by and they might jump me as well. But in any case, these two leaders failed to be human, to show compassion and mercy, to make a difference in a life and death situation. Hosea 6 verse 9 says it this way, As marauders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. It's almost like the priest and the Levite murdered the guy by just simply avoiding him. And that's really what happens when leaders fail to take initiative they're committing sins of omission that are just as serious as, as sins of commission. Now Jesus reaches the climax of his story. A Samaritan, someone the expert in the law would have despised as a scum of the earth. He happens to come upon this man lying in the road, but he stops. He applies oil and wine to his wounds and bandages him up, places him on his donkey for an ambulance ride in the town. 
He watches over the wounded man all night at a hotel, nursing him back to health at his own expense. Furthermore, the next day, he goes down to the hotel manager and says, hey, I've got money to pay for the room until he's better. And when I get back, I'll pay whatever else I'm owing you. Jesus then turns the lawyer's question around. Who is my neighbor, is what he had asked earlier, but now Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? This is not about who is my neighbor, but rather how can I be a good neighbor? It's also interesting to note here that the expert can't even get the word Samaritan out of his mouth. He feels almost forced, however, to make Jesus' point by saying, the one who had mercy. He was the one that was a good neighbor. So what does it mean to you and I to lead like Jesus? Taking lessons from this parable, we know that number one, leadership knowledge is not enough. The expert could quote the scripture. He had that down pat, but Jesus emphasizes the doing part. He turns the guy's question from a passive to an active response. Number two, leadership begins in the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Failure to keep God's command springs not from lack of information, but from a lack of love. To lead like Jesus means to love like Jesus, and that is a heart matter. Key point number three, leadership is about taking time to influence everyone you meet. Taking time. True, Jesus had his inner circle of Peter, James, and John, and his 12 disciples whom he spent the majority of his time with, but notice how he also took time for others. He was not so focused that he ended up ignoring the bystanders. Just consider the lady who touched the hem of his robe while he was on urgent business to get to the home of a dying girl. Or think about that widow at Nain who had just lost her only son and he stops and raises him from the dead. Or, or blind Bartimaeus beside the road. It's amazing how much Jesus accomplished at three miles an hour on the dusty roads of Palestine. How many people he influenced. See, if we're going to lead like Jesus, we need to first of all notice others and then take time for them. Key issue number four, leading like Jesus may involve risk and be costly. The Samaritan, most likely a wealthy businessman, given the fact that he had a donkey and you know could spend that much money on putting the man up at a hotel, um, this Samaritan knew the perilous situation that he was putting himself into by reaching out to this wounded person. I mean, the robbers could have easily pounced on him as he made himself vulnerable in bending down to nurse this man's wounds. But he took the risk to do what was right regardless of the cost. Key point number five, leadership flows from a heart of generous compassion. Something that uh, best-selling author Tim Sanders would call an abundance, flowing from an abundance mentality. The Samaritan in direct contrast to the Jewish leaders who uh, came before him on that road, he took pity on him, the text says. He acted humanely. Dwayne Elmer, a prof from uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, says it this way, there are three types of people. The first type is represented by the robbers who believe that what is yours is mine, if I can take it from you. The second type of people are represented by the priest and the Levite who believe what is mine is mine and I have the right to keep it. And then there's the Samaritan who simply showed up with compassion and said, with his life, what is mine is yours if you have need of it. Here's some leadership lessons from the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what does it mean for you and I? Does it mean just more knowledge on how to be a better leader? Or does it mean a new heart, a heart of compassion and love? Should I focus on my mission primarily or should I focus on people, which is my mission? Jesus called us to lead generously with compassion and mercy. And then last of all, what were Jesus' final words to this man? He said to you and I, along with the lawyer, go and do likewise.